Welcome to War Games, hosted by the sales genius Joe Ingram. If you're looking to win the sales battle, then you have joined the right team. In the War Games group, we devise strategies for sales, marketing, branding, mindset, and attitude. We enlist the assistance from the most successful producers across all industries. We then share their knowledge and techniques with you. Our single goal is to get you ready for your next sales opportunity. When it comes to crossing the minefield of sales, step in the footprints of those that have crossed before you. Now, Prepare yourself for boot camp and beyond. It's time for the war games to begin. We play the game? Good to see everybody today. Welcome to the show. So I'm going to pull Brian up first because he's joined us. He's actually found his way back home as yes. opposed to traveling all over the country and speaking to people. So welcome, Brian. Thanks for having me, Joe. Of course. All right. So today, okay, one of the key things as I was listening to the intro there that we need to make sure we focus on, which is marketing. And Brian and I just, you know, got yelled at a couple of weeks ago by Brad Lee about our thinking too small when it comes to marketing and what to do and how to do it. Yes. So uh, this is very, very appropriate that we have the founder of Elevate and Scale. His name's Kyle Stout. I'll bring him on in just a section, a second. But um, he's going to help us unlock hidden revenue potential that we have through his expertise and I like to say the email marketing wizardry that he's going to share with us. But he's got a background in copywriting and brand storytelling. And if you know all of us here in the entrepreneurial space, even those of you that have a job that have to eat what you kill, right, it's going to be important for us to make sure that we can generate intelligent and converting email marketing because we may not be marketing at all that way and thinking we're just going to run an ad on social media and go for that. But Kyle has achieved remarkable success with e-commerce businesses, which is a good thing as well for all of us. So I want to bring Kyle up onto the stage now. Kyle, welcome. Thank you for having me. Oh, no, the pleasure is ours because we want everything that's in your head. Okay, so awesome. We, we definitely want to do that. So um, can you do it a little favor real quick and just give us a little bit more in depth on the background as far as, you know, your trip to the success of being the e email marketing guy? Yeah. So, I mean, I started out as a freelance copywriter. Really, it was just trying to, uh, you know, take on any projects I could get. So I was doing a lot of sales copy for people's websites and that led to me doing more copy for other marketing channels. Uh, so email marketing, you know, writing ad copy, things like that. As time went on, I found that I really enjoyed email marketing. And I noticed I was getting the best results for people through email marketing. And I liked that it was a consistent, reliable sales channel. And so, you know, at first I was doing, I was doing a lot of website copy. It was like a lot of one-off projects. So it was a very feast or famine kind of cycle. And I liked that email marketing was an area where I could get consistent results for my clients, but also there was that consistent business relationship where they would need the service on a regular basis. So it was just a great fit, I thought, for a service to expand into um, as an agency. And because I and I also did initially try to be the all-in-one kind of marketing agency where you know I was offering everything, and I quickly found that you can't be great at everything. And it was, it was, I had issues of hiring other people who just weren't as good as they seemed at those other things. And so then I, I very quickly just honed it into email marketing, and that was around 2019, and I've been doing it ever since. That's fantastic. And I hear this all the time because I'm one of those guys who grabs onto everything I could possibly learn and then try to teach it, but it's the, the niche down niche down into what can be produced and you know what you're passionate about is always important too and so one of the things i tell people is that you can be passionate about it or not but if you have a skill set in it then let's make some money with it <laughs> and then you can pursue your passions outside of it just with a big bankroll so i think it would work better that way 
Yeah. I mean, that's an important point because it's not like I'm super passionate about email marketing. I mean, I, I do, I do like it. I enjoy it, but it's not like I dreamed of doing this when I was a kid or anything, you know? So sometimes right. you find something that works and it just makes sense to lean into it. No, I, I agree completely. So um, a majority of the, the audience that's uh, watching now, it's so funny because I'm looking at the number up in the top of the screen, but I have text messages from people too that are going, oh my goodness, I need email marketing. But one of them that came through told me, Is, isn't is email dead? And so <laughs> I'm sure you hear that plenty of times uh -huh. that, okay, email is dead right now, but is it or is it not? You said you got a lot of success, so that's why I want to learn from you. But yeah, what do you yeah find so, that? well, I think, I mean, that's just, I, they could be joking. That's a funny, that's just a common, you know, phrase in the marketing yeah. world that gets thrown around every all the time. Um, actually, so, no, email marketing is definitely alive and well. It, it's kind of funny. So whenever I meet people in real life and I tell them what I do, the first thing they say is, oh, I hate getting those emails. And then the next thing they say is because I always buy from them. You know, so it's one of those things where even <laughs> okay. when we're consumers, we may not like we may not always like having our inbox filled with all of these marketing emails from people, but it does still work. Absolutely. No, I, I agree. I mean, I've done it plenty of times where I've ended up buying something from the email that comes through or it's an existing relationship I have and it triggers my brain to go visit the site again to go and buy something. Yeah. So and that's a big does part it work of it. As well on service businesses as it does on product businesses. It does. I would say that it's kind of spikes where uh, more on the front end and then on the long term. So whereas with e -com, I think it's easier to have, uh, more consistent sales, no matter what type of customer or wh where they are in the life cycle with services. A lot of times it's going to be, you know, you're generating leads and maybe you're using some sort of free offer to get those leads. And some of those leads are already in the market. They're ready to buy. And those people are going to convert. And you have a lot of people who just, maybe they were only there for the free training and maybe they're not, they're not in position to buy right now. So it might take them longer. So it does require more nurturing long term for a lot of those people to actually convert to the first purchase. Fantastic. OK, because that makes a lot of sense. So when Brian and I speak on stage, right, we can always get something from somebody on the free offer. But do you have time frames that you say in your mind? And it's so funny. I told you it's not an interview show, but I'm so intrigued by the topic because I'm such a novice at it that I, I told everybody just like normally I told Kyle, you're going to take the show, but I'm so greedy for the information that <laughs> I'm thinking the same thing. I got to ask. I got to ask. So, oh, no, it, it's all good. Uh, I like the questions. So, uh, you know, feel free. All right. So, so is, there oh, sorry, a cycle or, sorry, is there like a cycle, a time frame that works best? So like old school sales, it's buy or die, right? You just chase them until they buy or they unsubscribe kind of deal. Um, I did a... a clubhouse room the other day with grant and grant chases unsubscribes which mm -hmm. i thought was just insane when when i heard about it 12 13 years ago when he and i were talking and it was like no and then he's like i still do it he's like i sent out 400 million emails to my database every year and i'm like oh, this is just insane and i know because i've unsubscribed and so um <laughs> But he still has people purchase because they see him as far as the marketing. So is there a best practice? Is there something that you look at and go, well, if you're only doing it for 30 days, you're an idiot, right? That kind of stuff. Yeah, well, so there's there's different ways you can approach it. So one thing that a lot of the, like the people like the Grant Cardones and the Frank Kearns, one thing you'll notice that they do is they always seem to have new free and low ticket offers. So yes, they are being very aggressive with their email marketing, but they're not showing up pitching the exact same thing every time. So they might focus on a particular offer for three or six months or something, or even a year, um, and then they'll switch it up. And then, so they, so there is a, a some level of re-excitement so they can get people excited about something new they haven't heard of before. And they're really, what they're trying to do is they're trying to get people back into the sales process towards the main offer, whether it's a consulting program or sales training or whatever, um, they, they rotate those. And I think that's a great way for service businesses because 
beyond just sending, you know, more nurturing style uh, emails. So if you're someone who puts out a lot of content, if you're active on social media and you're doing podcasts and everything, well, then you do have lots of reasons to continue to email them because you have some something new to give them. Um, as far as like just trying to continually give educational emails where it's just education in the email itself and not going out to anything else, you know, it, it, it tends to get repetitive. Um, and it, it tends to get to where they're like, eh, I've heard that from you before. And that's where having those new offers comes into play. So that's something I recommend. Uh, and then and one thing to also speak to the, the super aggressive email marketing like Grant Cardone does is so some of these guys, they just if you have a huge source of traffic, if you just have a never ending supply of leads, you can do that. If you're if you're not a business that has that never ending supply of new opt ins, you don't want to be that aggressive because doing taking that really aggressive approach, you are going to get a lot of people off the fence right away. So a lot of people who are kind of a maybe you're going to push them to a yes quicker than they would have. But you're also just going to push a lot of people away where a lot of people are going to unsubscribe, like you mentioned. So it's just you have to thread that needle. And actually, I'm going to be talking about something, uh, talking about that a little bit later as far as like just dialing in your frequency. OK, perfect. Brian, you had a question. Yeah, Go I had a two part question. So um, I had one initially and then your information led to a second one. So the first one is. If I have a free download, do you believe to go ahead and have when you give when you send them the thank you email and they're downloading it, do you immediately start pitching other products that are in there or do you just let them get the free giveaway and then you start your email campaign uh, campaign after that? OK, so if it's are you talking about a PDF or yeah, a PDF? So I give away like a, a cheat sheet that after somebody sees me speak, I'll say, hey, if you want the cheat sheet, go here or if you want to copy of the presentation you know, I can send that to you in a PDF. When you send that, do you also start putting other products in that thank you email? Uh, so it, it's, it depends. So what, what are you trying to upsell them to after they download that? Anything. <laughs> so no, I, I was thinking about a, a, a double purchase instead <laughs> yeah. of a single purchase. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like if they go and they download the cheat sheet, I was thinking about putting the next level product, which is a $97 product and then okay. the flashcards. So what I thought is, Hey, Thank you for downloading here. This is what really helped change it for me and helped me learn the fastest were the flashcards. And that's it. Not a big high ticket item. Yeah. So that that's what I would recommend is trying to, to go from the free offer to the low ticket offer to the mm -hmm. higher ticket offer. Sure. And the free thing should be something that's quick and actionable. So it's something that they can put to use right away. They get a quick win and now they associate that, that, you know, that initial success with you and they think, okay, well, I got, I got this result from his free thing. Let me, you know, and they're, they're probably interested in the higher ticket thing. Right. But at this level, they might not be comfortable yet, but so they're thinking, okay, I got this quick win with his free offer. Let mm -hmm. me try this lower ticket offer. That seems, and assuming that there's alignment between the free offer, like if, if it's a natural lead into where 100%. the thing you taught them and now the, the flashcards enhance what you taught them in the free offer, it's like, oh, I might as well get this because I want to get even better results than I just got from the free offer. So it's an easy upsell. And yeah, I think you should definitely at the end of the PDF mm -hmm. have a page where you sell that. Make sure you connect it back to how this is going to enhance what they just got out of the free thing. Right. Um, and then, yeah, you can, and then you can immediately start. That's actually usually where I would start pitching people on that next thing or the follow-up emails after that. Okay. Uh, part two of what you were talking about earlier. So I do put out content, not as consistent as I should, but three to six times a week of videos that are educational and it's a different feature. Um, so like I talk about facial features, so I'll do, I'll go over a different feature every single video. And then I need to get better about putting them into a blog on my website and then emailing that out once a week. Um, so do you find once a week, twice a week, once a month? Like if you, let's say you have three to five videos a week, do you backlink to YouTube or to Instagram? Cause I was thinking YouTube, cause obviously Google would love you then, but then how often are you recommending sending an email out to your client list? And I, it's small, it's 1200 people. Okay. This is going to depend on how engaged they are. So this is something you can test. So what I would do is first start with like, let's just say once a week, mm -hmm. do that for three or four weeks and see what open and click rates you're getting. 
And so that's going to be a roundup. You're basically going to, you're going to be sending them everything you did that week or mm -hmm. the previous week or something. Right. Um, so then try after that, try doing twice a week. So now you've got it split up. So the first half of the week, they, they get the first half of the stuff, second half, so on. And then see if the, if the engagement breaks down significantly, if you're still getting the same opens and clicks that shows that, okay, these people are, are pretty engaged. Like they, they're actually wanting this more frequently. So I would, push the frequency until you see a big drop in the opens and clicks. And you're probably not going to see a big drop in the opens. You're going to see a big drop in the clicks, mm -hmm. um, especially now because a lot of open rates are inflated because of iOS. So I don't pay as much attention to opens as I used to. Okay. It's going to be the clicks. And so if you do see that, I would back it off. I would, I would kind of, you know, back, go back to where you were, you were holding steady because mm -hmm. it's really about figuring out because every audience is different. So, you know, certain newsletters, especially if they're uh, if they're tied to the news in any ways, in any way, like if it's, you know, you're selling financial services and there's there's financial, there's new financial headlines every single day. A lot of people, they want that every single day. Right. But that's not going to be the case for most businesses. Right. So um, so it's going to be, you know, for you to figure out how active people are with engaging with and, you know, consuming and implementing this content you're doing. That's a way you can test their engagement. And mm -hmm. you really just want to go off that. Don't worry about what other people are doing or, you know, uh, like what worked with maybe even in some other business you're operating in because every list is different. Got it. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. No problem. We're going to let you go into what you prepared now, Kyle, because we've selfishly got all of our information from you. <laughs> okay. No, this is good. And, and the, the, Debbie, Debbie thought it was a great question on hers because Debbie has a business as well. And so she's got a one she's starting up plus one she already has. So she's going to say, how often do I hit my email list? And your answer was absolutely perfect. So, okay, awesome. Yeah, some of these things uh, we're going to be talking about. Some of these things. So, I, I just based on your questions, I think this is going to be useful. So, um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, throw them at me anytime. You know, I, I don't. It doesn't matter if we have to stop and answer questions. And you know, I, I'm not worried about perfect. that. So, okay. So let me see here. Gonna share. Okay, so what I'm gonna cover is I really want to focus on I would say beginner to intermediate. So if you haven't started with email marketing, I'll give you some just general tips to get going. And okay. if you are doing email marketing, I'm, I'm gonna focus a lot more on what you can be doing to improve your email marketing. So the first question I get, which is funny because someone asked this earlier about email marketing being dead is, you know, why does email marketing still matter with social media and all these other different tools that we have available? And I'm not going to go and, you know, I'm not going to bore you with theory, but I would say it really boils down to one main thing for me. And that's email marketing allows you to have a direct line of communication with your leads and customers on a platform that you own and control. So one of the things that we're seeing now is we put so much time and money and energy into creating content on all these other platforms, you know, social media and, and different platforms where you don't actually own the leads and customers that are there. You don't own their data. And so you, you put, you invest all this time and energy into it and then things can change. So you can have an account get banned. Even if you didn't do anything wrong, there's just, you know, weird things happen you can, uh, they can change the algorithm and all of a sudden you're, you're not, your posts aren't being seen by near as many people as they were. And it's just not having that, that full control and ownership of the list to me is, is one of the negatives, not to say that you shouldn't do all those things. Cause of course they're great and they can help you build your email list. But that is one of the, the main things I find most useful is that you can always find a way to get your message into their inbox. Um, and then beyond that, there's, you can, there's a bunch of stats and, and of course this is just an average, but what I find is email marketing is very cost effective. So it has an average ROI of $36 for every $1 spent. And that is just an average. So some businesses are going to see a way better ROI and some won't see as good. That's still phenomenal. It, I mean, for any, that's the thing. Email marketing really doesn't cost that much compared to everything else now you know i mean you I, do have it depends how you're doing it if who you have doing it if you're or if you're doing it yourself um you know the cost of creative in in any space obviously is gonna there's gonna be a big investment there uh depending on how good the creatives are but 
compared to, you know, advertising, digital advertising, for example, I mean, it's, it's way more cost effective, but again, I don't think you should only do one versus the other to, to me, it's about doing both. It's just about, it's about doing social media, running ads to bring traffic to your site and then using email marketing to convert people on the back end. So that way you're getting a better ROI on everything you've invested into that traffic. So that way you can then go and invest more into getting more traffic. So it, I really see it as a holistic thing. Okay. Um, okay. So if you are getting started, these are really, this is the, the first main thing that you need to get done. So the first thing is you've got to have a way for people to be able to sign up on your list. So you've got to have opt-in forms on your website. So you can use pop-ups, sign up boxes, landing pages. And I know a lot of people don't like pop-ups, but whenever you go to different websites and you see these pop-ups all the time, there is a reason why so many people are using them and that's because they work. So if you really have something against pop-ups, I would recommend at least setting your pop-up to be an exit intent pop-up, meaning that it only shows up whenever someone is leaving the site. So you don't have to just bombard them right away when they land on the site. Uh, but this is the, the form that, that we consistently see the most opt-ins for. So you definitely got to have a pop-up and then, to get people to sign up, you've got to offer something in return for them giving you their email address. So I call this a lead magnet. So if you're an e-commerce business, this could be a coupon. It could be a free gift with purchase. For uh, other types of businesses, it could be a PDF, a free training, um, a, a consultation. There's many different things, but you need to have something that they get in return for signing up because just saying that they're going to get access to exclusive content or something like that, that people used to say that just doesn't work anymore. It's not it's not enticing enough. Uh, so you need to, to offer them something in exchange for them signing up. And then what gets really neglected here is that people will create the form, they'll create some sort of free offer, but then they don't really make a conscious effort to actually build up their list. And so that means you, beyond everything else you're doing on social media, podcasting and everything else, you want to make a conscious effort to tell people on all these different channels about your email list, or really I should say about the lead magnet offer. So you want to consistently push that message of why they should sign up to your list and you know why they all the benefits of the lead magnet you've created. And the big thing here is we're just trying to get all of these people off these channels and onto the email list because that's something that we own. So going back to the initial point. So the more you can you can get uh, people from Instagram and YouTube and Facebook and everywhere else onto your email list, the easier it is to gonna be to generate sales from those people. Okay, so now let's talk about whenever you actually sit down to create the content. So this applies to any types of emails. It could be campaigns, automated emails, whatever. Uh, what I find is that people have the most trouble coming up with the email campaigns. So a lot of times when you're setting up your initial automations, you, you already have some topics to guide what you're going to say, because they've just downloaded some free offer. Uh, so you're going to, and you're probably pitching something else. So you already know what you're going to talk about. The challenge a lot of people have is how do I keep showing up, you know, week after week, month after month, year after year, and keep finding new ways to talk about the same stuff. So, and also the other thing is just making sure that the emails are actually effective and that you're getting good engagement and that you're converting people uh, for sales or whatever else you're trying to do. So the first tip I like to give people is to focus on who, not just what. So that means you wanna focus more on who you're selling to than on what you're selling. So to do this, you need to initially research the hopes, dreams, desires, fears, concerns, and worries of your ideal customers to craft emails focused on the things they care about. So I think, you know, most people who are in the marketing space are very familiar with this. Um, you've probably heard of a term like customer avatar or buyer persona or ideal customer profile, whatever, whatever term you like, you need to create one of those. And I'm going to talk later ab about an easy way to do that. But the big thing here is that when you're sitting down, if you think about the mindset of when you're sitting down to write the email, if you're focused more on who you're writing to, the copy is just going to be better. It's going to come off as more empathetic. It's going to come off that you are interested in, in their needs and that you care about them. And that's way more interesting to people because ultimately everyone cares about their own interests first, as opposed to if you always take the frame of only talking about what you have to offer instead of what it means to them. So that's a, that's a big thing to 
again, it's just it's more of a mindset to have when you sit down to write the copy. Another thing to keep in mind is you should assume that the reader will skim your email before reading. The most important lines of copy in your email are the subject line, the main headline, the call to action, and I would also say the PS line if you have one of those in your email. People will typically read those lines of copy in order before they go and read everything else in the email. So they will jump from, from subject line to headline to call to action to the PS line if you have that. And if they liked what they saw, then they will go back and read the email, hopefully. And so you want to make sure that the reader gets 90% of the message from these three things. So when you're sitting down again, when you're sitting down to write copy and you have limited time and you're trying to figure out where do I focus my energy, I would say don't be as picky about the, the copy that's in the email in the paragraphs. You want to spend more mental energy on making sure that you've really dialed in the subject line and the headline and the call to action because those are the things that really move the needle. And if you get those things dialed in right, it doesn't matter as much, not to say it doesn't matter, but it doesn't matter as much what's in between because those that's just kind of filling in the details. And this is what's really going to have the impact on them. Now for uh, a general copywriting tip is to use simple conversational copy. So your copywriting should be friendly, conversational, and easy to understand. And a good rule of thumb is to write at a third grade reading level. So um, it's not to say that everyone on the internet is dumb, but there are a lot of dumb people out there and people just don't read. So if you've, if you've done a lot of email marketing, you've probably gotten uh, you know hundreds of questions from people about things that you specifically answered in the email. So that's one thing, but you know, just even ignoring the fact of not trying to use complicated terminology and all of that is that you want to make sure it's super easy to understand. So for example, if you are an e-commerce business and you're offering a BOGO deal where they can buy one product, get one free, and they have to use a coupon code and they have to actually add both products to cart and then add the coupon code. You need to actually mention that you need to have a little like asterisk and a little disclaimer in the email because the customer service team ends up getting tons of emails from people who just added one product and the coupon code. And they're wondering why the other product didn't magically appear. So you have, you can't make assumptions about what they know. It needs to be super easy to understand. And again, it's going to be, you want it to be conversational. It's like writing an email to a friend. It's just going to be more relatable to people. Um, and people really, they connect more with other people than they do with corporations. So the more you can make it friendly and just like a, make it like a fun email, the more they're going to enjoy actually receiving your emails. And then the last thing yeah, I want to mention. I, I love that. And Debbie already threw up there. Wonder what's going through Joe's brain right now. Cause he never thinks anyone is dumb. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sitting there just laughing in my head, but I, she saw me spark when you said that, but when you said you got to put both things in the cart before. I was like, duh. But the way you said that was, I could see how they go. Well, then it would magically change the quantity to two. But the I, you hit me right now, and that's why I wanted to interrupt because it's on my head. But the headline, call to action, and PS, 90% of your message has to be there. That to me was, that to me, I, I don't read that way. So again, your knowledge and your expertise coming in is going, look, this is what they do. And I'm like, I would never read an email that way. But that makes sense so, to me. If you don't grab me in the first sentence, I'm done. So yeah. So and you're the type of person who likes to learn, right? You're yeah. always trying to learn and evolve. So what I find is that a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people who are really focused on self growth, and, they're, and they just generally are, are curious, or they're trying to learn, they actually read they actually read the emails, they read everything. So they don't really miss the details as much, but, but from sending out thousands of emails, I can tell you that for as much work as we put into the emails, most people don't read the whole email. And it, so it's, it's really frustrating. So you have to, and a lot of times also, because we have so much knowledge on what it is we're offering. Uh, we've probably talked about it a lot before even doing the email. And sometimes we make assumptions. We just forget about little details that we think are obvious that are just not obvious to a lot of people because you are dealing with the internet. So you sometimes have to, you know, think of the lowest common denominator. Agreed. No, that's phenomenal. I got a text over here too that says, um, do you have templates that is already built, like the structure laid out? Like somebody said, does he have 
an example to show of what a well-written email content would be. No, I didn't put that in here, um, but I could, I mean, I could, uh, I could give some, you know. Well, they got to do something. They got to go to elevate and scale and schedule a call with you anyway. So at that yeah. point, you can send it to them once they do that. Give yeah. Them a little nudge. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, I've got a ton of samples to show, but no, I don't, I didn't put that in here. Okay. Um, and it's going to be different for, for what type of business you're selling, but in general, you don't, these emails don't have to be super long. So, and they also, they don't have to be heavily designed. That's another thing. So in the e -com space, I will say it's, it's way better if you have nice designed emails with good photos and graphics, because that's just a very visual space. When you're selling services, we're selling SaaS. Um, there's a lot of times where, or if you're selling info products, you can go text only. So really yeah. it's not the design doesn't matter. It's just, there's, there's more pressure on the copy. And the thing is a bad design really takes away from the copy. So I would say if you're going to have nice designed email templates, then if it's not going to be a really good design that enhances the, the email to just go with text only and really focus on having good copy. No, that's perfect. Thank you. Uh, Okay. And, um, okay. So then the last, the last thing I want to talk about here, this is something that I call having a reason to show up in their inbox. So one of my go-to, uh, angles to take for writing email campaigns is to use a conversation starter as a topic for the email uh, that creates a natural segue to your offer. And the, the big thing here is that you don't have to offer a discount to generate sales from email when you do this. So, to give you an example of this, like let's just say we are talking about supplements. A lot of times, um, whenever people are you know creating a promotional email about a product, let's just say it's like a, a protein powder or a pre-workout or something, they might show a photo of it. They might list off five or ten benefits, and they'll have a CTA button, and that's it. And but the problem is that so you can do that sometimes, but how many times can you do that before? for people just get blind to that. And it's just, it's just the same old thing. So what I would prefer to do is if I'm wanting to continually talk about this product over time. So, you know, once or twice a month or however often we're talking about the specific product, every time I show up to talk about it, I'm going to have a new reason to talk about it. So it could be, you know, um, let's just say there's an ingredient in the pre-workout that helps with your focus in the gym. So what I would do is I would have the whole email really be about educating them on the benefit of the mind muscle connection and how you can improve your focus in the gym. And at the end, there's just a natural segue to tell them about, you know, Oh, by the way, this pre-workout product also has this ingredient that does this exact thing. So the thing with that is that even if they're not in the market to buy today, I gave them some value where they can actually, that can help them improve and help them get better results with something they care about. And then for the people who are in the market today, and if that was something that resonated with them and they care about, it's now an easy decision for them to go buy that because I've just, I've spelled out uh, in detail a, a reason that goes just beyond, you know, five bullets. Oh, that's fantastic. So how would you, I, looking at the bottom two boxes you had, you talked about the subject line and then the conversation starter, are they one in the same? Or do you, do you start with the converse, with the tag, the uh, subject line, and then you build it into the conversation of the email? So I usually uh, write the subject line last. So I do all of the email copy first. And then I think about what's the most enticing thing about this whole email. And I will use that as the subject line. Perfect. Okay. And so here are some ways that after you've been doing some email marketing and you're sending out campaigns, this is a way to improve the engagement that you get with your list and improve the targeting of the emails you send. So uh, segmentation is something that it, it gets overlooked, but it's actually, and sometimes it, it might sound complicated if you've never heard of it. It's, it's usually pretty simple to set up with whatever email software you're using. And so the first thing you want to do as you start to personalize your email marketing more is you want to create buyer segments. So you can segment your list into groups based on their engagement, their interests, their purchase history and all kinds of other things like their their gender, uh, where the location of where they live, all kinds of things. And the point of this is that when you have different groups of people to send different emails to. So an example of an engaged or an engagement based segment could be a 30 day engaged group. 
And that just means that these people have engaged with your emails in the last 30 days. So they're, they're really engaged. And by engaged, I mean that they've opened or clicked your email in the last 30 days. And you can create these different time frames. So you can have 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, you know, one year, whatever. And so the thinking there is that the people who are the most engaged, they typically want to get the most emails from you. And the, the people who aren't as engaged, you're better off not emailing them every single time because they're going to ignore them. And it just becomes this habit where they, they always see your emails and they always ignore them. But if they get a break from getting your emails, then it becomes a more novel experience when they do get one from you. And the other thing is whenever you have something that's super exciting, like a new product launch, a big sale or whatever, I like to send to those wider engagement groups because those are the things that a lot of these people who maybe haven't engaged in a while are going to be interested in. But a lot of the, the more regular content you're sending out, so if you're sending out uh, you know, content roundups of content you've done online recently, those things I'm going to send to the most engaged people because they're going to be the ones who are most interested um, in, in getting that more frequently. And the same thing goes with you know, uh, interests that they've expressed by you, know, you can tag them based on products they've viewed. You can uh, create segments around purchase history. So this could be specific products they've purchased, or it could also be um, the number of times that they've made a purchase. And the whole point of doing this is that we we can send targeted emails where you can craft email campaigns with content that, spe that speaks specifically to the needs and concerns of the segment you're targeting. So this is another thing that so not only does it make the email more interesting and relatable to the person who's receiving it, it actually makes it a little easier for you to create the email because a lot of times, you know, if you're trying to appeal to everyone on your list, you have so many things to keep in mind, but whenever you're focusing on a specific group, especially if you're focusing on, um, you know, specific product interests, or they signed up for specific free offers and these things that indicate their interest in certain areas and, and the fact that they might not be interested in other things. Now you can craft the message specifically to them. So it's easier for you to sit down and create the copy or, and create the content. Um, and it, for them, it's a lot more targeted. And so that just feels like, okay, I mean, it's, it's always gonna be uh, more interesting to someone, the more you're speaking to the things that they actually care about, as opposed to something where, you know, they only care about two of the 10 things that you mentioned. And then the last thing I wanna bring up here is the use of dynamic content. So everyone's probably familiar with how you could just add someone's first name into an email and all of that. But there's actually other ways that you can use dynamic content that will change the content of the email based on the subscriber's purchase history or interests or, or other things. So for example, let's just say, um, you know, you, you have a variety of info products and services and you send out an email campaign and you're going to have a section in the bottom that is pitching them on one of those products. You can have it set to where maybe people who have never bought anything before are getting that little pitch section about your lowest ticket item. And then people who have bought the lowest ticket item are getting a little pitch section about the next higher up item. So these are ways where, again, it's like the, the whole email itself didn't have to be totally custom for each person, but you customize that piece of it. And you could do other things like, um, you know, if, if you have a rewards program, you can have it set to show their rewards points balance. There's all kinds of different ways where just those subtle little things, it not only is, are they feeling like they're getting a more personalized experience, you're actually, just, but you're making it more useful for them as well. That's amazing. Okay. So this is one of my favorite things. So whenever you mentioned in the intro about unlocking hidden revenue, this is what always comes to mind for me. And I, I call it optimizing your sales process. This is really just getting all of your email automations set up. And so this is the process I would recommend any business do. It doesn't matter what type of business you have, it's going to be a little different for different types of businesses. But this is one of the biggest opportunities. If you haven't done much with email marketing, this is going to be one of the highest priority, biggest opportunity things to do. So the first thing is you want to audit. It should say audit your sales process, not audit out. You want to um, audit your sales process. So first map out the step-by-step -step process it takes for, for someone to go from being a stranger to being a customer and then audit the conversions at each step to identify where the biggest gap exists. So what does that mean? So if your sales process looks like um, someone signs up for a free PDF and then after that they are pitched on a consultation call and then after that call, maybe you have to, um, you know, uh, maybe there's some, there's some 
either manual follow-up, like you have to send them a, a full presentation. I'm blanking on the word of what you would, a proposal, sending them a full proposal. And then after that, they would close. You can look at, okay, where can we add automated follow-up in between each of these steps? And then how you decide where to attack first is you just look at your analytics and look at, okay, how many people make it to each step? And where do you see the biggest drop off from one step to the next? And that's usually the first place that if you add some follow up in that spot, some automated follow up, you're going to increase your conversion. So the goal is to just automate your sales process as much as possible. Obviously, some things are going to require manual follow up. The more your business is uh, geared towards being like an e-commerce business or a SaaS business where people just click to buy, the easier it is to set these things up. So again, you know, whatever type of business you have, you want to map out the step-by-step -step process and get your numbers at each step and find out where the biggest opportunities are. And then from there, it's just all about creating the automated emails that are going to trigger at each stage. So, you know, if it's an e-commerce business, that could be things like your welcome series, your abandoned cart emails for service businesses. They're usually going to be follow-up sequences that are tied to specific offers that are trying to move them up into higher offers, things like that. And then this is one area that I think is the best uh, where you get the best results from A-B testing. So because these emails are automated, a-B testing is most effective in these emails because the conditions for who receives the email and when they receive it are consistent versus a campaign where you've just got all kinds of people of different interests, different levels of engagement. So you're not really getting consistent feedback from those people when you run A-B testing. And also like once you, know, you learn something from one test, but then you go create a whole new campaign and you're kind of guessing on, well, they like the way I said this, so I should say something like that. That's not really that accurate versus having an A-B test in these automated emails where the conditions are pretty consistent as far as when, you know, who and, and when they're receiving this. And I find that this is an area where you can actually see improved results over time pretty quickly with A-B testing. I love it. That makes sense. So you're auditing out, because you put out, right? Auditing out the, the clips. <laughs> so that, to me, it worked. I'm going to audit out the clips in my sales process where yeah. all of a sudden everybody drops off. Yeah, that's exactly. So, uh, yeah, I originally had build out and then then I changed it. Yeah, but uh, that does make sense. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so really quickly, this is kind of a summary of some of the things that we've talked about a little bit, but these are some some of the biggest common mistakes that I see people doing. The first one is relying too much on discounts. And the mindset behind this that I have noticed from people is that a lot of times we don't like getting emails and we have this idea that if we send people emails, we're just annoying them and we feel like, well, I need to give them a discount or else they're not going to want to buy. And like we've already talked about, it's really more about leaning on the quality and variety of your content to generate sales than it is from relying on discounts. And so discounts are, doesn't mean you don't ever discount, you know. The thing is that whenever you can generate sales with without discounts, now the big promotional sales you do become more potent because you, you aren't doing them all the time. So this is a big thing because if people, once you get into this trap of sending discounts too often, you train your list to, to never buy at full price and now you're just eating into your margins. The second one is using the wrong... Yeah. yeah. The, the, sorry, did you want to say something? No, I was going to say you you trained them to wait for a discount, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm I, that guy who goes and goes and says I'm thinking about buying something. I put it in the shopping cart and I wait for the abandoned shopping cart message to come back and offer me a percentage off. Yeah, I mean that's a yeah. I have certain there are certain companies I shop from where they do sales so frequently that um, every time I want to get a new thing, I always just wait for the next sale because it's always right around the corner, you know. So like, why would I pay full price if they're going to offer me 30% off in the, sometime right. in the next few weeks, you know? Um, okay. So then the next one, this is what we were talking about earlier, earlier with the sending frequency. And so most people, they think of the issue of sending too often, but for a lot of businesses, especially if you have a bigger list and you have an engaged list, a lot of times businesses aren't s sending emails frequently enough. So it's really just it's about figuring out what works for your list and for your business. And, and again, what, like we talked about earlier, the way to test this is to just slowly increase your frequency 
healthy until you see that engagement fall down. And again, it's not going to be so much with the opens. It's going to be a lot more drastic with the clicks. So I would pay more attention to a big drop in click rates than in open rates because you will find that you can a lot of times maintain pretty good open rates while sending to a lot of people who are, are unengaged. And a lot of that is just because of the uh, the iOS update where you're just getting a lot of, you're getting this uh, report of an open whenever they didn't truly open it. And then the last thing here to keep in mind is you don't want to be sending every email to everyone on your list. And the reason why is, I mean, besides the fact that it's just not going to produce results for my emailing a lot of those unengaged people. But the bigger issue here is that if you consistently email these people who are unengaged, it will decrease your deliverability because Gmail and the other inboxes, they have these strict filters on, um, they notice whenever people aren't opening or clicking through your emails. And if they get a lot of negative feedback like that, they're going to start showing your emails to fewer people. So that could just mean, you know, first you end up more often in the promotions tab, but it also means that you start ending up in the spam folder, even with people who are engaged with your emails. So this, this is one of those things where it kind of, it's a slow, it's a slow trickle until all of a sudden it becomes a huge problem where you're just like, okay, why are we getting so fewer sales from our emails than we were in just, you know, six months ago. And a lot of times if you're seeing that and you haven't really changed much about your strategy and you feel like the content's still good, it's a deliverability issue, which can be corrected pretty quickly. It's not, it's not as, you know, huge of a deal as people make it out to be as far as, you know, it's not like your um, account is ruined now or anything, but it's a, it's a major problem because if it goes unnoticed, it will just eat away at your engagement and your sales. Um, okay, so now I want to talk about this is something that's that's probably top of mind for a lot of people, and that's using AI for email marketing. And you know, everyone's talking about ChatGPT and the other AI tools. And so a lot of these AI copywriting tools have been around for years, and they really weren't that good. But in the last you know six, twelve months, it's come a long way to where I think these tools are actually really useful for email marketing now. Now, and this is coming from someone who has a background in copywriting. So, you know, you would think I would be pretty biased towards copywriting uh, from a human. Exactly. So, um, yeah. but I want to talk about the strengths and kind of give you some, you know, just general feedback on this. So the first area that I think AI is really useful for email marketers is doing market research. So I found that AI is really great at conducting the market research that you use to uh, create your ideal customer profile. So that way you can then create really targeted email copy. And then the next thing that it's really useful for is idea generation. So what's really cool is that once you've created your ideal customer profile, you can now plug that into whatever AI tool you're using and ask it to give you ideas for email topics specifically for these people. Because if you were to just say, hey, give me, you know, email topics for um, a broad market. So, you know, people who are in the market to buy a home, that's one thing. Uh, and it's just going to be kind of you know, they're going to be generic ideas. But if you are listing out specific demographics in the specific area of where these people are buying and all of that, now you're going to get very targeted topics. And that makes it way easier for you to actually create the email copy. And then from there, I don't recommend using the AI copy verbatim. But if you take this more detailed approach, by the time you have it actually write the email copy, so once you've got those topics, you can then tell the AI outline this topic for me and copy and paste the topic it gave you. And then you can uh, take that and have it write the email. And I'll give you some uh, some tips on the next slide about how to improve your your uh, inputs to get to get better copy. It's to the point now where the copy is a pretty good rough draft. And then you really just need some minor editing and polishing to get it to the final draft. So we are not doing, we are not actually taking, you know, AI copy and, um, you know, using that for any emails we're sending out. But what we are doing is having our copywriters use AI to speed up the process of idea generation and then getting rough drafts. And what we'll end up doing is having it create multiple variations of the same email and then taking different sections from the different variations they created and kind of mixing them together and something we like polishing up the copy of course it needs to be brand specific and use the actual language but we're finding that this saves a ton of time and for someone who is 
just getting started with email marketing and they don't have a copywriting background, a lot of this is just very intimidating. Honestly, you can do a pretty good job as long as you, again, always pay attention to the final edit of the copy. You can get pretty good copy from the AI now if you are putting in detailed prompts. On that note, are you uh, seeing or suggesting a certain percentage of altering of a, say, chat GPT because they know, well, that's not owned by Google. So they're calling it the Google slap if you like Russell Brunson. So they're talking about you need to alter X amount. Is there a percentage that you're finding better success of changing those messaging uh, messages with? Yeah, well, we're not focused on a, a certain percentage um, because we're really not using, we're just not using the copy verbatim. It's more about, it's really more the copy of providing ideas. Now, there are going to be a lot of people who are using it closer to verbatim um, because they don't have a copywriting background and they're just not going to be as picky about the copy. And for those people, yeah, that's why I, I recommend don't just take the copy because you don't want to get penalized. We don't really know what's going to happen with all of this as far as, you know, how strict these penalties could be, how good they're going to get at detecting it. But it's better to play it safe because we've seen with Google in the past that um, they retroactively apply rules pretty harshly. So that's something where I think it's definitely just better to play it safe. Um, so yeah, for us, it's not, I couldn't even put a percentage because it's really taking, it's almost taking just a few words of the sentence and then, and then changing the whole sentence or taking, um, I mean, we rarely even use the order in which the copy was spit out where a lot of times we're rearranging the order. And so it's really just getting the ideas. So it's like, I liked the, I liked a couple of the sentences from this variation of, of one email. And I'm going to mix it with a couple of sentences from a, a different variation of the same email that it created. And then that might be one third or two thirds of the email and the rest I'm filling in with my own copy, you know, something like that, but it's different every time. So sometimes it's a, sometimes it's a very it's, small it amount. It expedites the process and, and it, that probably triggers you enough to be even more creative on your part when you fill in. Exactly. And a lot of times it's not even having it write the whole email. It's I've written the email or one of the other copywriters has written the email. And we are, we're just, we don't really like how a, a certain phrase is said or a, or a certain headline and we'll have it give us ideas for variations of that. So it's sometimes editing up or giving us new ideas for our stuff. Okay. So it's really, it's a tool. Cool. I really see it as a tool that a copywriter has to make them be a lot faster and to um, cure writer's block if it comes up, you know, help just help stir up ideas. No, that's fantastic. Okay. Okay. So on this note, this is how to get better AI outputs because it, it really is the quality of the output you get really comes down to the quality of the prompt that you give the AI. And this is why a lot of people, when they, whenever they play around with these tools and they get this just terrible generic copy that just sounds totally off from what they are envisioning, it's a, it usually comes down to not giving the right details in the prompt. So first thing is you want to add more detail. So, the, so rather than just having it write an email, you want to add details about your business, about your customers, uh, the segment you're targeting and the type of email you're sending by having all of that in your prompt, you're going to get a, a much more specific output for that email copy or whatever type of copy you're getting. The next thing is you want to perform multiple iterations. So you don't just want to settle for the first thing it gives you. Sometimes it's pretty good on, on the first shot. A lot of times it, it's, it's not. So that's where you go back and you say, Hey, can you rewrite this with specific instructions. So can you rewrite this with more humor or can you rewrite this with more urgency? Um, or can you say this with, with a different tone of voice and you tell them what tone of voice where you can say, yeah, I don't like how you focused on this, uh, you know, whatever, whatever angle they took. Can you take an angle that points people more in this direction? Those are the kind of iterations you give it. And, and that's how you get way better copy from it. So by taking these little extra steps, the, the copy you get in the end is much easier to edit because you're just getting so much closer to what you're trying to get. And again, throughout these iterations, a lot of times I'm taking pieces from the different iterations and kind of piecing them together and rewording them in my own way. And then uh, the last thing is if you wanted to model something that's worked in the past or something that you admire from other companies, you can actually also give it examples 
um, of copy that you like. So if you're writing a video script, you can take a video script from from a big influencer that that yeah that you just really like the way that they do their scripts, and you can put that as an example and have it give you scripts that are more similar to that format. And you can do this with email, you can do this with landing pages, headlines, whatever. Uh, the more details you put in your prompts, the better the output is, and the more time it ends up saving you. Okay, so that's it. I know we were we were getting short on time, so I was trying to rush through the last. Yeah, last Brian, few slides there. Brian and I selfishly took the first twenty minutes, so you're good. <laughs> as I was looking, I'm like, we are going long, but um, as long as you're okay. So um, I I love the concept of going in now. Rhonda put up the same thing I started writing down. She put it in here too. She loved the part about the key elements for scanning emails, right? And how it can help structure the content for your ideal customer and avatar. So we got another one that says uh, AI is a great tool for optimizing email copy. And Mo Rock walked away with just send more emails. Got it. <laughs> so <laughs> that was his take on it. But no, I think it's fantastic because I do believe that I love the concept. Very simple. The audit, automate, and then A-B testing. Right. That was to me, it was a simple framework that can be implemented by anybody to go in and say, here, this is what I have to do. But I want to say thanks to you, Kyle, because it doesn't seem as daunting as I had imagined it, because every once in a while I get excited. And I'm like, I'm going to send off an email to the list. But then, you know, the excitement leaves me and I no longer do anything. But what systems are you using to track all of the open rates and stuff like that? I, I just picture somebody because you brought it up with the uh, person who doesn't put the two items in the cart for the free one. I'm like, this same person is going, I'm going to go do an email blast and a list from my Gmail and go see how many click rates there are. And I can't see any of this stuff. What's going on? So what are some of the systems you recommend to say this would be a great one to use? Okay, for uh, for e-commerce businesses, my favorite by far is Clavio. That's the one that we primarily use. For um, really, for I would say this applies to almost any business besides e-commerce service businesses, especially Go High Level is one I really like. Now, Go High Level is goes way beyond just email marketing. So it's email marketing, it's CRM, it hosts courses, all that. Um, another one that's really great for all types of businesses, but again, I would say not as much for e-commerce is active campaign. So those are okay. some of the three that I really like. What, but I recommend for people though, when it comes to choosing an email software is to first look for the, the email software providers that really cater to your business type, your industry, because they're going to be a lot more user friendly for you. They're going to be set up with specific features you need. And the less that you have to integrate things, to accomplish all of the automations, the way easier your life is going to be. So that's the first thing. And then if you found some good tools that really cater to your type of business, as long as they have all the, the main things you need, like being able to do email automations, uh, segmentation, some of the, some of those things that, you know, weren't always available in some of the most simple tools then just go with the one that you like the user interface, like you, the one that you're actually going to feel comfortable using it's going to be the one that gets you results because if you don't use it, you're not going to get results. So right. it, it's not as big of a deal as people think, um, but those are th that's definitely what I recommend. Perfect. Thank you. Brian, any questions? No, he answered the ones earlier. Uh, and especially I appreciate you saying go high level because I use MailChimp today. And as your audience increases, so does your cost. And it looks like go high level. Not only are they based in my backyard here in Dallas, but they just have so many freaking features. I just need to know who am I going to go with to use them because everybody's like, Hey, I'll put, give you on this for this price and this price. So anyway. Yeah. I was gonna yeah. Say, we all have a referral link for go high level. So <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Uh, but yeah, go, uh, go high level is it, like the more you dive into it, the more capabilities it actually has. And there's a lot you can do with this, you know, SMS to, uh, voiceless phone or what do you, uh, sorry, uh, ringless, ringless voicemails, voice all kinds of stuff, AI chat, all kinds of stuff. So it's a, it's a really cool tool. No, fantastic. So across the bottom, it's been scrolling the whole time. Elevate and scale.com. Is that the best place to find you? Yep. So if you are interested in hiring a team to manage your email marketing, then that's where I would go. Otherwise, if you're just interested in getting more content around email marketing, my, the, 
channel I'm focusing the most on right now is my YouTube channel. So, and it's Elevate and Scale, same name, same handle at YouTube. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Well, you'll probably pick up Brian and I as subscribers pretty darn quick. So, okay, awesome. Uh, and as we and as we get all the rest of the people that watch the replays, because we are in the middle of the day, no matter where we are in the United States, uh, we do pick up a lot more view count afterwards. But um, this has been fantastic, Kyle. I appreciate the simple, easy way to bring everything across. And um, it's going to make it a lot easier for us to, to get through this. But give your quick free win, right? Give your free, your actual lead magnet when it goes in. But one of the things you said that triggered was, hey, you got to have the quick win for that person so that they think to themselves, hey, this is going to be great that I'm going to go put this out here and it's going to be good. I, if it works this on the free one, then the next step up is going to generate a lot of stuff for me. Exactly. Yeah, I, do. I love that. That makes a lot of sense. So, All right. I think we are golden at this point in time. So Kyle, I appreciate you for coming on. Um, Sales Genius Podcast, War Games Group Live. So I appreciate you. they will get you out there and I'll get you the copies and stuff like that. And everybody else that's out there, go out and sell something. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.